my depth that fits dead beneath the water I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between what remains of me Good morning, church. All right. Well, uh, happy Mother's Day. So uh, I hope everyone um, can take the time today to remember all the mother and mother figures in your lives. And uh, if you're lucky enough to, you know, um, appreciate them, then please do. So uh, as we start this morning, uh, we've been studying the life of Joseph so far. Um, we've seen a theme of pain, suffering, waiting, uh, brokenness. Uh, but we also see this theme of God continually at work. And we see that Joseph went through the pain of being sold into slavery by his own brothers, taken to Egypt. Yet recently we saw that God was still at work in the way that he uh, made Joseph prosper under his uh, Egyptian master's household. But then last week uh, we left it where uh, Joseph was just unjustly put into prison. Now he's stuck there for two years in another season of pain and suffering and waiting. And uh, as I read about that uh, this week, I was reminded by you know, specific seasons in my own life um, where there was uh, either pain or brokenness. Um, I was able to see, you know, God make good out of that. Uh, so this morning as we sing and uh, prepare our hearts for the message, let's uh, reflect on our past and current seasons even of brokenness. And may God just open our ears to hear what he has to say to us this morning. So would you rise with me? <clears throat>
I'll praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. Whoa. on the sunrise to where you sleep in the sinner's past and oh how fast would you come running it's just a shadow me through the night trace my steps through all my failures and walk me out the other side for who could dare mountain, that valleyed hill called Calvary, before the one I call Good Shepherd, who like a lamb was slain for me. I will praise you on the mountain, I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my feet is In the highlands, in the heartache we call grace a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave so I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way you're the summit where my feet so I praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Lord, as we think about our past and the current seasons of brokenness, Lord, we remember in Isaiah 53, it says that you were pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. You were beaten so we could be whole. So Lord, we thank you for experiencing this brokenness and suffering to redeem us. I hear the 
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. to see you and receive you. In Jesus' name. Yeah, you don't understand the amount of hours and time and labor and patience that it's taken for the children's ministry to put that together. So um, anyway, so we are continuing in our sermon series uh, of God with us as we go through the book of Genesis. And so today we're going to be looking at chapter 41. For the sake of time, you know, we knew, uh, we knew we were going to be tight on the schedule. So I'm going to be jumping uh, through and skipping some parts of the scripture, uh, of the scripture reading uh, and just summarizing really quick what the next section will be about. But we're going to be looking at chapter 41, starting in Genesis chapter 40, verse 23. And so again, I'll read a portion of the scripture and then I'll kind of cue us in terms of what happens in the next section. All right, so starting in Genesis chapter 40, verse 23, it says this, Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And then in verse 1 of chapter 41, After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And so it talks about the, the dream that he actually has, which we'll get to later on in this passage. And then we're going to skip down to verse 8 and 9. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them about his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. 
Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. And so he shares with uh, the Pharaoh what had happened that we talked about last week as Pastor Art was preaching. And, then, uh, and so then the Pharaoh summons uh, Joseph to come to him. So we're in uh, verse 14 now to 16. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that you, uh, of you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Again, then in, in verses 17 all the way down to 24, it reiterates the dream. Uh, Pharaoh shares it with Joseph. And now in verse 25 to 28, Joseph's going to talk about this dream and interpret it. So verse 25, then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows that you dreamed about are seven years. The seven good ears of grain are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. And then in, in chapter, uh, in verses 29 and following, then Joseph starts to talk about the plan. This is what my proposal is. This is what we're going to do in order to take care of or these years of plenty as well as these years of famine. Basically what they were going to do is take one-fifth of all the produce in these seven years of plenty okay, and store them up in the storehouses so that they'd have enough to cover them during these seven years of severe famine. Okay? And so now we're skipping down to verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his, uh, to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And then finally, we see that Joseph starts to execute you know, his entire proposal and all these things. He starts collecting all the produce of the land. They've, they've put all these things in the storehouses. And then we're going to skip to verse 50, where it says, Before the year of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. Bore, uh, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For, he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second son he called Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, there was famine in all lands, but all the land of Egypt, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, what he says you will do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much again for this day. God, we thank you for um, this day of recognition for our mothers um, in our congregation, in our church. God, we want to recognize them. We want to celebrate them. God, we th we're so thankful for the ways that they sacrifice in so many ways uh, for our families and also for our church as well. God, we pray for a special blessing upon them. 
God, we pray now as well that you would open up your word. God, this is a, a long passage in which there's so much to, to pull out from, so much to apply from in our lives. And so God, I just pray that you would speak mightily through your word. God, that you would give us insight. God, more important than just knowledge, um, God, that you would give us things to be able to apply into our lives as well. And so God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And we commit this time to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So I am, if you did not know, I think I shared this before, I'm a, I'm a big Marvel fan, um, a Marvel geek. I remember, I think two years ago or so, uh, my, my older daughters and I, we went through a whole Marvel uh, Infinity Saga um, watch party, or not watch party, like binge watching, basically. Um, anyway, so I'll typically I'll have something streaming at home, you know, whether it's one of the TV shows or one, whether it's one of the movies and whatnot, you know, just so I can see if I can catch something new. Um, you know, whenever a new show comes out, um, you know, I'll see if there's any new connection between the movies and the new TV show and, and all these things. Anyway, so all that's to say, this past week, uh, I was streaming or just kind of playing in the background uh, Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever, right? Um, and, and so, you know, when I, the first time I watched it, I wasn't like all that impressed. And so I was just like, well, again, I'll just have it playing in the background. Uh, if you haven't watched it, um, I love to do this, spoiler alert. Um, but there's this one particular scene in this movie in which the main character, Shuri, okay, who is the sister of the since past former Black Panther, um, she was having this conversation with the antagonist or the antihero of the movie, Namor. Okay? And so she was in this season in which she was still mourning the loss of her brother. Right? And in this season of brokenness, she was asking, you know, why the ancestors would give me all these gifts, give me all these abilities and skills to potentially help my brother, you know, because in the movie he was sick, right? You would give me all these things to help him, and yet in the end, I wasn't able to save him, right? So she's just broken as she's sharing this with Namor. And Namor responds to her. He said, my ancestors often say, only the most broken people can become great leaders. Only the most broken people can become great leaders. Okay? Now, I know that this is not a definitive statement, okay, but I thought it was very timely given the subject of our sermon today. Right, we've been progressing through the life of Joseph for these past couple of weeks and in our, one of our discovery groups, we're also talking about the life of Joseph, right? And then this past week, I just learned that our youth retreat speaker, uh, Lisa Pack, she was here a couple of years ago uh, speaking for our missions conference. She's gonna be speaking about the life of Joseph to our youth as well, all right? And so I was just thinking, man, like God is really using Joseph at this time to really speak to our church. But if you, uh, just, just that kind of as a review, you know, we're first introduced to Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, when he was only 17 years old, right? A couple weeks ago, we had our graduating high school seniors. You know, he's younger than them. He's the same age as my oldest daughter right now, right? He's gone through a series of seemingly unwarranted struggles in his life. He's thrown into a pit by his brothers. He's then sold into slavery, his parents think he's dead, so no one's out like looking for him, right? Somehow he ends up in a seemingly now great position and going to Potiphar's home, and he's set out to uh, be the main uh, uh, caretaker over the home, and then only to be wrongly accused of sexual assault to the man's wife, right? So then he ends up back in prison. And between that time and our passage this morning, now about 10 to 11 years have passed, right? And we see that in prison, Joseph has somehow gained favor as God is blessing him. He's gained favor in the prison, uh, with the prison warden. Now he's basically placed in charge of all prisoner affairs. Um, any of you have watched the movie Shawshank Redemption? It's my favorite movie, and if you've never watched it, shame on you. Okay, um, but he's kind of like Andy Dufresne, you know, in Shawshank Redemption, you know, running all the different things that are happening in prison. And so as we see from this story, uh, from this passage, you know, God 
throughout every single incident, every single episode that was going on in Joseph's life, God was always present. He was always at work in the midst of the brokenness that Joseph experienced. And so through the story of Joseph, we're gonna see three things that God develops through brokenness. The first thing is that in our brokenness, God develops prudence. Okay? Second is that in our brokenness, God develops perspective. And then third is that in our brokenness, God ultimately develops purpose. And so first let's look at this idea of that in our brokenness, God develops prudence. Prudence isn't a word that we throw around uh, all that often. You know, think like when was the last time someone described you as prudent? You know, maybe it wasn't, you know, they, they just didn't know the word, right? They might have called you wise, they might have called you discerning, but they usually don't word, use the word prudent, right? But prudent, I mean, it's actually, it's a good word, right? It means to be, uh, to have good judgment. It means to have wisdom and discernment. It describes someone that exercises a certain degree of cautiousness, right? Given all the experiences that they might have had. And so when we're first introduced to Joseph, I mean, the last thing that he was, if you think about it, was prudent, right? In fact, he comes across as an arrogant, immature teenager, right? I mean, think about what he said to his brothers way back in Genesis chapter 37, right? Hey guys, check out this dream that I had about the 11 of you, or the 10 maybe at the time, bowing down to me. By the way, mom and dad were there, and they were bowing to me as well, right? Oh, hey, Check out this jacket that I have that dad had specifically made for me. Oh, you don't have one? Aw, right? Like, can you, you can kind of see how this is like playing out in this narrative? Um, so it's not exactly the type um, or personality, if you will, that makes a good leader, right? It's not a type of personality that's gonna ingratiate others towards you. So at the youthful age of 17, frankly, Joseph was not ready for anything. In fact, he was probably a spoiled, entitled little brat. Now, not to justify his brother's behavior, okay, but the act of throwing Joseph into a pit and then him being sold into slavery no doubt taught Joseph a harsh lesson about humility, right? About how maybe you should interact better with others, how we can interact well with others. It probably taught him not to take these good situations that you're in for granted. And so when he ended up in Potiphar's home, we see that he took the position seriously. He stayed humble. He earned favor with Potiphar. He didn't let things go to his head. And based on a lot of the stories that we'd read and studied thus far in Genesis, you would think, right, you would half expect that Joseph would have fallen into temptation with Potiphar's wife but Joseph actually ends up becoming one of the few characters in scripture that actually kept his integrity intact. And he fled away from these wiles of this woman. And yet even despite keeping his integrity, then we see this downward trajectory, right? Again, Joseph was wrongfully accused and thrown into prison. But while in prison, he's shown favor and he starts to build relationships, right? He starts to make connections with some of the prisoners that were in there, and especially prisoners of status. We see some wisdom, we see some shrewdness that is being built within Joseph. And then we learned last week that Joseph ends up helping two prisoners to interpret their dreams, of which played out exactly as he said they would. And he asked the cupbearer, again, in his wisdom, to particularly, you know, like, hey, man, if you can just, like, mention my name to the Pharaoh, just give me a shout out, right, so that he can remember me and know that I'm here in this prison, all right? What's interesting is that early on, okay, early on in his, you know, when we first learned about Joseph, Joseph boasted about his dreams, and that's what got him into trouble. But now, after all this time, after all these things have happened in his life, you start to see discernment setting in. You start to see prudence setting in into his life. And so that now this time around, Joseph humbly offers his services, if you will, to interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the chief baker. He trusts 
in God rather than boasting about himself. And in doing so, Joseph starts to make a name for himself. But not in a narcissistic way, not in a way in which it's going to uh, uh, lift him up or lift his name up, but rather in, the, in a way to make a name to represent and to lift up the reputation of God. And so then, even after two whole years, as we get into our passage, two whole years of remaining in prison, we see now that finally the cupbearer remembers Joseph. And when Joseph is now brought in the presence of the Pharaoh, he's not like, yes, yes, I, I, I can help you. Just get me out of here, right? But rather, he still has the same attitude that he showed in the previous chapter. He still gives all the credit to God. In verse 16, it's similar, again, similar to the last chapter. He says, it is not me, okay, it is not me to interpret dreams, but rather God will give the Pharaoh a favorable answer. And then you see when you go down in verse 25 and 28 that Joseph says again, he gives the credit to God. God has revealed and shown the Pharaoh what he's about to do. Again, this is really important for us to understand because back then in the Egyptian culture, if you were able to interpret dreams and you were seen as one of the priests, you were seen as one that was lifted up because of this divine ability. And Joseph could have capitalized on that, but rather he still decided to give all the credit to God. It's not about me. And so we see through all this brokenness that Joseph experienced, he learned humility. He was able to discern, to discern that God was indeed moving through all these dreams, the initial dreams that he had. And he was attributing all these things that were happening to God. Through his brokenness, through this ill circumstance that he was going through, he allowed for God to shine through him so much so that even the non-believing people around him knew that there was something special about this person. If you look at verse 38, it says that Pharaoh makes this bold declaration about Joseph. Can we find a man like this? I mean, he had priests, he had all these other people that he brought in, invited to try to interpret these dreams, but none of them could do it. And so he says, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. You know, so as we reflect on this first point, I know that there's some of us here, maybe many of us here, who are either going through difficult times right now, or maybe you've just gone through some difficult times, or maybe even in the past, past couple of years, you've been going through things. Maybe it's family-related. Maybe it's work-related. Maybe it's school or friend-related. Maybe it has to do with loss of a loved one as you guys are going through and other hardships that you're going through. This is not to trivialize any of these experiences that, you, that might have taken place, but do you believe, do you believe that these experiences might have taken place in order to give you that much more insight, that much more empathy to perhaps serve and minister to others who are also going through tough times. And like Joseph, do you realize that God also desires to shine through you so that others might be able to see the hope that you have through him? There's this uh, Christ, uh, Christian author, Nancy Guthrie, who once said this, and she, you know, she was writing a book about sorrow and um, you know, going through these uh, difficult times as well. And she said this, the truth is we want our grand abilities and keen insights to make us usable to God, right? We want to see these grand abilities and these keen insights that we have to be made usable by God. And then she says this, not our broken hearts and crippling weaknesses. But as she was thinking through this statement, it says that she came across this quote from A.W. Tozer, who's well-known for a lot of devotionals as well as uh, a well-known book called The Pursuit of God. But in this particular quote, he said this, it is doubtful, it's kind of like the Black Panther, book, <laughs> uh, Black Panther quote, but it's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. 
right? And what Guthrie was getting at is actually it's not about these abilities. It's not about all these talents that you might have to bless people, but it's rather about the broken moments that you have that you can share and that you can empathize and that you can console people with because you yourself have gone through these things, right? And so God uses these brokenness, uh, these brokenness moments in our lives to build up prudence and understanding in our lives. And that brings us to our next point, that through brokenness, God also develops perspective. Looking at verse 46, we see that now Joseph is uh, 30 years old. Okay, so 13 years have passed since Joseph first shared his dreams with his brothers. But those uh, original dreams still haven't manifested yet. And so in the next six years, okay, Joseph is enacting his plan to prepare for the famine. And then in verse 50, as we read, it says, Before the year the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. The first named Manasseh, the second Ephraim. And I bring this up because of the significance of the names of Manasseh and Ephraim. The name Manasseh literally means to make someone forget or make to forget. And Ephraim literally means to make fruitful. Okay? So in Joseph forgetting, okay, he was saying that he was forgetting all the hardships of the past. He was forgetting his father's house okay, because he was no longer dwelling on all the hardships of the past and only looking at the present. What is God doing now? Right? What is God doing for the future? In observing the fruits of his labors, he was able to see the effectiveness that God was doing through him, the effectiveness that he would accomplish, rather than, again, lingering on the pain and the hardship that he had to endure in the past. Notice the shift in Joseph's perspective. If you were to uh, go back a little bit in chapter 40, Verse 15, when he was talking to the cupbearer, asking him to remember him and share to, him about the, uh, share to the Pharaoh about him, and he said this, For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have, been, I have done nothing that they should put me into this pit. Joseph shifts, okay, from a bit of this victim mentality, if you will, okay, and is now showing a victor's mentality, right? Throughout this process, I believe that Joseph was able to see how God was, in all these moments, God was allowing for these things to happen. God was moving through these incidents. God was preventing certain things. God was providing. God was even waiting. I was listening to a sermon uh, this past week, and the pastor was sharing about, um, you know, something that we've probably heard, you know, but oftentimes our approach to prayer and, you know, how do we discern God's will? And he was sharing about a common understanding about how God will typically answer our prayer requests with either a yes or a no, right? And, but, but oftentimes the answer no, okay, doesn't necessarily mean a definitive no, but rather sometimes it serves as a, well, not yet, not now. It's just not the right time at the moment. And this next part, as he was sharing, was really helpful for me. He said, you know, if we go to him in prayer, and our request to him is not right, well then, yeah, the answer is going to be no. Right? If we're just asking for things selfishly, well then, yeah, the answer is going to be no. If the request is actually right, it's a good request, it kind of follows along with God's will, but the timing isn't right, okay, then God might say, slow. Okay, slow down. Now, if the request is right, timing might seem like it's right, but if you're not right, if you're not walking with the Lord, okay, if you're still having hardships, well, then God might say, you still need to grow, right? But if all three of these things align together, where the request is right, the timing is right, and you're right with God, then God says, yes. It rhymes. Go, right? Or yes. <laughs> he says go, right? When these three things align. As I was, you know, thinking through that, and I was kind of relating it to Joseph's life, you know, early on, it was clear that Joseph wasn't ready. He needed to be broken. 
And God used this brokenness to slow Joseph down from this original dream that he had, right? Even though this was the right dream, okay? But he used these brokenness time, uh, this broken times to allow him to slow, to grow through his experiences until he was ready and right with God. And when he was right, then we see how this perspective changed, okay? From an inward focus in which he was boasting about his dreams, you guys are bowing down to me, right? To now an outward focus for the people and especially for God, right? And then he was ready to be used. And it's the same for us, right? Whether you're young, whether you're old, there's many of us here who've had to endure many hardships. So readiness, okay, is not necessarily something that has to come with age or just comes with age, right? So our, all of our youth here, this still applies to you. I want to share this verse that I, that I believe in so much, you know, verse, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. And it says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct in love and faith and purity. Okay? So just because you might be young, it doesn't mean that God is saying no. But as you go through various circumstances, you gain different experiences in your life, be aware that God might be using these seasons to tell you, slow down. It's not quite the right time yet. Or you still need time to just grow. The request might be right, and don't get discouraged just because I might be telling you to slow down. We have to believe that in his time, God will also help you to change your perspective, to not focus on just the brokenness, not just on our own circumstances, but rather to change our perspective to be God-focused, to be others-focused, and see how will God potentially use the different circumstances that we're going in to help others. I was looking ahead um, because I'm going to be jumping to chapter 50 really quick. Um, So I apologize to Jonathan Lay. I think he's going to be doing our last message. So hopefully this doesn't spoil his message, and hopefully it's not too much of a spoiler alert for all of you guys. But if you were to jump to chapter 50, verse 20, we finally see the fulfillment of Joseph's original dream in Genesis 37, right? Where his brothers are actually in the land and are actually bowing down to Joseph. Just like those sheaves of grain, just like those stars in his dreams. And in this ultimate shift of perspective, Joseph says to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph saw all these things, you know, that happened in his life, and we see that perspective completely shifting for the right. Well, that brings us to our last point, that in our brokenness, God develops purpose. God's timing, I don't know, is is really funny in terms of why he had me watch this Black Panther movie, but I'm referring it to a again. (laughs) Right before this scene that I introduced in in, uh, the introduction, uh, there's this dialogue that was happening, again, between Shuri and Namor. And Namor was telling the story about the origin of his people. This is, you know, how we came to be and all these different things. And so Shuri was, you know, there, there's a little bit of miraculous effect and all that stuff. So Shuri's asking Namor, how is it possible? How is it possible for all these things to have happened? And Namor responds, how is never as important as why? How is never as important as why. You don't understand the amount of wisdom that comes from these superhero movies, right? <laughs> but as I thought about that phrase, right, it's so true. Right? Oftentimes we question the how, right? How is this going to be possible? How much is this going to cost? How much time is this going to take? How many people are going to be involved? How am I supposed to lead this? How is more oftentimes focused on the self. But really the only question 
that we should be asking is the why. Why is God moving us towards this direction? What or why is God's purpose in this? See, the why is focused on God. If we trust in the why of God's purpose, then the how, quite honestly, doesn't really matter. God will take care of the how. Again, when we look at the story of Joseph, you know, thankfully we have the gift of hindsight. Now, in the New Testament times, we get to read back and kind of see what is happening in the Old Testament, right? But we're able to see that in every situation that Joseph went through, right, God, again, was moving, okay? And what we ultimately realize is that because God had a purpose in mind, that meant that God would take care of how everything would happen. And so as we think of the sequence of Joseph's story, you see God's purpose being weaved through all the hows, right? If Joseph didn't have the dreams, then he wouldn't have shared it with his brothers. If he didn't share it with his brothers, well, then they wouldn't have hated him at that moment. If they didn't hate him, well, then they wouldn't have thrown him into the pit. If they hadn't thrown him in the pit, then these Midianite traders wouldn't have found him and sold him to Potiphar. If he hadn't met Potiphar, he wouldn't have been in his home. If he wasn't in his home, he wouldn't have been su- tried, you know, tried to be seduced by Potiphar's wife. If that hadn't happened, then he wouldn't have been thrown into prison. Yada, yada, yada. Right? All the way to the point to which he was in Pharaoh's presence. God was able to orchestrate all these different things to happen where now, as we finish this passage, Joseph is the second most powerful person in all of Egypt, if not the world, as we saw that the world also came to Egypt to be able to take part in this providence or this provision that Joseph and God had prepared. Again, if we only think about the how of, God's, uh, of Joseph's story, we would think, well, how could God let all these things happen to him? But when we take a step back and we see the purpose, suddenly all these hows blend in perfectly into this beautiful mosaic of a story. So what's the purpose? You know, as we look at this story, I believe the purpose that we see here is that God desires for us to be able to make maximum impact on others rather than to be comfortable for ourselves. Let me say that again. God desires for us to be able to make maximum impact on others rather than just to be comfortable for ourselves. God is not interested in making us comfortable. God is not in the business of giving us the five bed, five bath house, and this is Texas, okay? Um, a, two cars, three cars, a spouse. I said originally two and a half kids, but again, Texas, three and a half kids, right? Um, but God is in the business of shaping us so that we can be valuable to others to make maximum impact in other people's lives. And that maximum impact is making disciples. It is winning people to Christ. Short of becoming the Pharaoh himself, God used Joseph's brokenness arc to bring him to a position that would make maximum impact on the world. Through Joseph, God was fulfilling the covenant that he made with Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. Okay? He was providing the means by which the Israelites would sojourn and become slaves in Egypt. And he was now providing the way to save all the people from certain death from this famine. And through all this, he would ultimately start the process of making Abraham the great nation that God pr- uh, promised that he would be. Those are just the hows. But when we see the purpose weaved in. We see that beautiful mosaic that is this story of God. In the end, as we wrap up, I'd like to invite the the worship team here as we respond with a couple songs. Um, As we look at the story of Joseph, we see also the ultimate purpose. The ultimate 
purpose that's weaved throughout Scripture. That Joseph's story would point to the one. He would point to the one who was ultimately broken for us. You see the brokenness arc and story of Jesus, God's own son, in which even God the Father, his goal and his aim was not to make his son comfortable, but to be praying and weeping and crying and bleeding, sweating blood because of so much anguish and brokenness that he was going through, of betrayal, of being nailed to the cross, of being beaten and tortured to where he couldn't even carry his own cross. That is the purpose so that we might be able to see him. We might be able to understand that he did that for us. That is the ultimate purpose, the ultimate brokenness arc, that Jesus, the Son of God, would give all that he was, all that he had to make maximum impact for others if we might believe in him. Jesus was the most impactful person in all of human history by becoming the most valuable sacrifice for us. And so I ask us, I ask all of you, what is God doing in your life? If you're going through maybe some broken moments, some hardships in your life right now, try not to think about how. How could you do this, God? How could these things happen to me? But rather ask, why? What are you doing? Why are you using this? Do you want to use this so that I might be able to impact others around me? Let's pray. Father, first and foremost, we thank you, Jesus, that you allowed for yourself to be broken, God, to be beaten and bruised, God, for us. This is the punishment that we deserve because of our sins, God, and yet you bore that for us because you knew that you were the only one, God, that could take away every sin of this world if we would believe in you. God, we thank you that you were willing to be broken. God, we thank you that you lived out this incredible purpose for us. But also as followers of you, as believers in you, God, as we commit our lives to you as Lord and Savior, God, that we would respond in the same way. God, use me, even if it means I must be broken. Don't just use the abilities. Don't just use the talents that I have. But God, also I'm willing to be broken, that I might minister to others. God, that I might win some to you. God, because we can relate, because I can empathize with the things that people are going through, just as you empathize with us. And so, God, we thank you. Help us to respond to you. God, help us, even in the darkest of moments that we have in our lives, God, that we would cry out to you and yield all that we are to you so that we might be used by you. Thank you, Jesus, that in brokenness, Lord, you are always with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise and the, the same God that we saw in this story um, through Joseph's brokenness molded him, shaped him, and used him to um, save many, many lives and proclaim God to, to the nations. Um, it's the same God who lives in our hearts today. The same God who is working through our brokenness to shape us, that we may love him deeply and be able to love others deeply and impact others deeply. So as we sing this song, let's, um, let's remember that. On the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations, I 
know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, oh, your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the Lord. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness.
God's love never fails. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Cause I know that you love me Your love never fails In the strong and the waters deep But I'm not alone here in these open seas Your love never fails Chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fails You stay You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in Rage. I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails oh, oh, oh. Your love never fails You may Work together for my good You made all things Work together for my good You made all things Work together for my good You made all things Work together for my good you Joseph, Lord, may you move in us, Lord. Move us to change our hearts that we might love you as deeply as we can, Lord, and love the others around us.
Lord, it's uh, with this thought in our minds we, we go into our weeks, and it's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining us again for uh, Sunday service today. We hope that God's word, uh, as it speaks to us, that we truly respond uh, in a way that is faithful in obedience uh, to him. Uh, in our brokenness, God never fails. He's always with us, and he always calls us to, to live for him and for him alone. So thank you, uh, Pastor Pat, for preaching God's word this morning. Uh, we're going to be transitioning uh, to our uh, welcome and announcements. So if this is your first time here at ACC, welcome. We hope that uh, this morning's service has been a blessing to you. Uh, so if you, whether you are here on our church campus or whether you are uh, joining us online, if you see on the screen, uh, we have a QR code. If you can just snap that uh, to your smart device and just fill out that form, that would be great. Uh, we would love to have a, a, a just a contact uh, with you in the next couple of weeks or so just to welcome you back to our church. And if you have any questions about ACC, we would love to answer them uh, for you. Uh, if you are here, uh, here in our service, uh, in a couple more minutes when service ends, please meet us by the foyer uh, where I'm pointing at. There's a connection center outside by the foyer. We would love to welcome you and say hi to you. Uh, so come in and, and join us in, and as we welcome you uh, to ACC. Uh, we do have a number of announcements. First of all, just want to remind you, uh, once a month, we just want to let you know about our prayer request form. Uh, you can go either to that link, acc.church slash prayer dash request, uh, prayer dash request, or if you have been receiving our email bulletins uh, on our uh, bullet, uh, bulletin towards the end of it, you'll see a button that says submit prayer and pray. So those two ways you can share your requests uh, to us. We have a prayer team that prays for you and intercedes on your behalf. So please do let us know uh, by, by filling out this form. Uh, the next announcement, uh, next Sunday, we have our North, North, Northern Thailand short-term mission fundraising. Uh, so after service next Sunday outside uh, uh, of Ming Dao building, they're going to be setting up and selling uh, Thai iced tea for us. Uh, if you can support this team in any way, that would be great. Uh, this is a, just a great way to partner with them and, and support them and walk alongside them. They also have a blog that they're going to be setting up that's, uh, that's on the screen. If you can subscribe to that, that would be great as well. You can follow through with them uh, as they serve uh, in Thailand this summer. So again, that, that's next Sunday uh, after service. And the last announcement is our youth retreat. It's going to be happening August 1st to the 4th. Pastor Pat mentioned it. Uh, Lisa Pak is going to be our uh, speaker for the retreat. So if you have any uh, kiddos that are um, in youth and are going to the youth retreat, remember May 26th is the deadline for the early bird rate. Uh, so I believe it's uh, $295. Uh, so go ahead and sign up before May 26th. After that date, uh, the standard rate, I think it's uh, 350, 360, I think, uh, is going to be uh, uh, the cost. Okay, so it behooves you to sign up uh, earlier by May 26. If you miss any of these announcements, uh, these events, it's all on our website, english.austinchinesechurch.org. So please uh, check all these events uh, online. Okay, if I can just ask all of you, if you can just stand up and let's receive the benediction and prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord. Even as we uh, celebrated Mother's Day, we are reminded that not just for the moms, but for all of us, Lord, that there are times when we go through brokenness, heartaches, and pain. Uh, but to know, Lord, that uh, you are calling us to begin to, to maybe let go of the past, just like Joseph, and to be reminded that there is a present and a future that you have for us, that you're calling for us to, to serve to let you lead and to let you guide, that even in our brokenness, Lord, there is a purpose that you have set for us to live for, uh, so that those around us who do not know you uh, may come to know this great God who saves, the, this great God uh, who loves, this great God who has a plan for each of our lives, and you are choosing to even use our broken lives, Lord, to proclaim that. May we live for you and for you alone, Lord, to be faithful for that, to that purpose and calling so that you and your name will be made known throughout the ends of the earth. May we always live for you, God. So now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, 
majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you here again next week. God bless. See